I had quite a few, but uh, I'll take on the uh, first one is the, our invasion of southern France. I was flying a C-47 with paratroopers for drop uh, above Marseille in France, or it's called the Southern France Invasion. Um, uh, we took off around uh, midnight with about uh, 18 to 20 some paratroopers fully loaded uh, with their equipment and parachute to land in southern France. Uh, we, uh, it was about 50 uh, C-47s in our school group when we took off one after the other and headed for uh, southern France broke off, broke into uh, the land, moved in behind Marseille in a special drop zone there which had been designated and uh, we dropped uh, at a designated time. The navigator told us we were over the DZ. We dropped, uh, gave a light and the paratroopers jumped out. We were about uh, 500 feet above the ground. Um, we did not uh, experience any fire at this time. There's a cloud on the ground. We could see the poles the Germans had put in the ground to prevent uh, gliders, which later we pulled in from Rome, brought in a glider after we dropped the paratroopers. And this was uh, the most memorable incident was when we went out to pick up our gliders. They were all lined up on the runway. My friend whom I set behind uh, school, in high school, I, the first time I've seen anyone I've known back in, from Frederick, Maryland, um, we decided that after the drop, the glider pilots would be sent back. I could see on his ear here, he's quite scared. Uh, the, uh, you pull this little lid up, you can see he's, uh, points here, the temple was just pulsating like that. Anyway, we said we'd meet, and we were the second plane pulling the second glider, and he was in the third glider pulled by the third plane. We came, this was in daylight now, we came over the drop zone again, and we saw these posts sticking up with the Germans that planted. And when we turned our plan, uh, air, uh, told our, glider to disconnect, they disconnected and went down. And this particular one, I didn't see him actually go down, but uh, they were loaded with jeeps or howitzers. I forget what he had, but anyway, uh, the, they, he had dropped his wheels somewhere after takeoff. And when he landed, apparently he landed too hard in the ground, stop, to stop the glider and whatever ran up over him and killed him immediately. And I didn't know it right then until we came back that night and he wasn't there. That 15 minutes? Yeah, that's fine. But see, that's not very memorable. Well, that's I great. wish you'd got some, like uh, Leroy Gross. Uh, but we got a bunch of people coming up. Uh -huh. I was in the uh, third bomb group. We uh, bombing North Korea, that was the, uh, went up to the Yalu line in a cold night, almost froze and come back. And uh, in Korea, you know, you didn't have the uh, radar mm -hmm. at night when they're shooting, they're like, uh, uh, it's real pretty when the, they're going over you like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you don't really feel it until afterwards, that, you know, they could have been hit because one of my buddies, it, it went right through the, when you're, you're turning, trying to avoid the, the lights and uh, 20 caliber went right through the, took out both of his, his eyes like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then you, as soon as you got out of that, dropped your bombs and come on back to uh, leave the country and check in at the island in North Korea, uh, then you feel it's all over. It's the, you don't, uh, you feel more scared then than you're scared when they're shooting at you. I don't know what, maybe something wrong with me, but that was the way it was. But I, I got hit twice, but 
never, uh, you don't get hit too many or you go on down. Uh -huh. uh, hit in the gas tank and uh, it's self-sealing in a B-26 and uh, it just makes a big noise. You're going down. Uh, we were supposed to be tr patrolling a road where the, all the supplies came down, the truck, to, they turned their lights on. We B-26 come over, come down with, uh, we can have as much as 14 uh, 50 caliber guns, you shoot them all at once, bring it right up through them, and they pretty well knocked the truck out. Mm. And uh, those are routine things. And, uh, I was a member of the Air Force for 20 years. When I was 19, I enlisted in 1953, which was just before the end of the Korean War. And I got out in 1973, just before the end of the Vietnam War. So I had the grand opportunity and privilege to work with several heroes from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and of course the Cold War. And of all the heroes I knew, they all had one common attribute, and that was fortitude. Fortitude is the quality that makes potential heroes out of all of us. It is, uh, on one hand, we have fort, a symbol of strength, and on the other, attitude, which is state of mind. We put the two together and we have fortitude, or strength of mind, to prevail in adverse conditions. The basis of it is faith in God and faith in yourself and your own abilities. The place where it really comes to mind is any time we directly approach danger, then fortitude is what is going to help us to prevail and succeed. I'm Sergeant Hill, First Methodist Church. I have been a member here about 30 years. My experiences in uh, World War II were interesting. I think the uh, first way that it all came about was my wife Frances and I ran off and got married on Sunday, week before Pearl Harbor. It may never have happened if that incident had happened before our marriage. Anyway, we had a great time. We uh, we're working at General Dynamics, so it was a very short time that I went in service in the United States Air Force. Uh, I had had civil pilot training at Texas Wesleyan College, uh, which included uh, flying and ground school. And from civil pilot training, we were able to get our advanced flying time, 75 hours, before service time. And some went in as civilian instructors, some went in as, as uh, student pilots. I went in as a pilot, and uh, my entire service was spent as an instructor pilot. We flew B-24s, and I trained some of the greatest generals in the whole world. And it was a great ride all the time. As a side, I might say that Ben Hogan and I were in school to, in, in the Air Force together. Uh, he uh, turned out to be a daily uh, golfer with the, with the general. And that couldn't happen, so they sent him off to a very fast OCS. And Ben was back swinging a ball as a lieutenant in 90 days. Anyway, the service time involved going to different uh, locations, training different uh, pilots. And my last and closing time was when I got my orders to go to Japan. And just at the time we were ready to ship out, 
we see, received notice that Japan had surrendered and that we would soon be uh, excused from the air service. So all this was very interesting, starting with Texas Wesleyan College in the beginning, because I came back in the end and got my degree, that good old government assistance program. And after that, I went to Pepperdine University and got my master's degree. So Texas Wesleyan was really great in my experience. Thank you. Well, I guess the one I remember the most is the first Air Force mission I went on, which was out of North Africa. I came in there shortly after the invasion of North Africa, and of course, we, Rommel was still in the desert. And we flew to a city by the name of Gabies. As we approached the target, we noticed a lot of flak in the air, lots of black clouds, and as we got closer to the target, all of a sudden I noticed some little sparks coming over the wings. I wonder what they could be. And then about two minutes later, I, all of a sudden I see this P, uh, this Messerschmitt. It was a, one of Herman Goring's yellow nose uh, best fighters. I could hear the gunners banging away. And pretty soon, I was talking to the tail gunner, and he says, here's what happened. He said he came in on the end, and he said, one of the shells hit my guns and knocked the electrical solenoids off of them. And he said, so that I couldn't use them hydraulically anymore. But he said, I thought maybe I could still do it manually. As he went around and started coming back in, the guns were kind of hanging down, but I picked him up just as he got within range, and I had to cock him first. And you normally couldn't cock those guns with one hand, it took two. So you cock one side and then you cock the other. I could do it with one hand or the other, I was so excited. And then as he came within range, I started shooting at him, and so did all the other pilots, I mean gunners. Then as we left the target, I noticed the left plane that was on our left blew up, it got a direct hit and all the people got out of it okay. But uh, then as we went on towards home, one of the other planes had the landing gear would part way down. And as we got close to the base, they called in and said they had to belly land, which they did and successfully. Then I had to come in and land behind them and I knew we had some holes in us. As we came in the final approach, I noticed my flaps weren't working. So instead of coming in at like, 145 miles an hour, I came in about 175 and managed to land okay. And it was a long field, a lot of mud on it. What else? First, I would like to say that everyone probably in the United States was aware on December the 7th, 1941 of the catastrophe that hit the United States. Not too many of us were aware of where Hawaii was or what was happening over there, but we got it on our radios and we all remember where we were and how it changed our lives, changed the lives of the entire nation. It was a very sad time for many, many people. And there were days of joy and gladness also. The first thing that I want to say about this time was that in our family, my father was minister of the First Methodist Church in Slayton, Texas, and my mother was the organist. This was a Sunday afternoon, and they were at the church rehearsing for a special musical program that night. And I was riding around with a friend of mine when the listening to the music on the radio when we were interrupted by the news of the Pearl Harbor disaster. So we immediately dashed to the church and ran in and told my family what was happening and my father dismissed the choir and we all went to our homes. 
And by nightfall, my older brother, who was in college, had called all of his football buddies who were scattered in various universities on football scholarships, and they all agreed that they would join the Marines after the first of the year. Our house was loaded with football players for Christmas, and it was a grand time of joy and celebration. And then we took all the boys to Amarillo, where they all enlisted in the Marines. Shortly after that, my father became quite ill with heart problems, and uh, he had to retire. They moved back to Burleson, where they owned property. And we didn't realize it at the time, but my father's death came soon after that. I was a senior in high school in, uh, in November of 1941, and uh, it was impossible to think of me going to college because we just couldn't afford it. And being very patriotic, we all wanted to do what we could, so I decided to join the, Mar the uh, waves, the Navy waves. And I took my basic training in Hunter College in New York. I was stationed at the Naval Hospital in San Diego, California. And the highlight of my military service was witnessing the first use of penicillin. This was a very, very thrilling thing. It was called the miracle drug. I was uh, stationed on a on a ward, we had private rooms too, but a spinal meningitis ward. And prior to this time, people with spinal meningitis just lasted a few hours. I've seen boys that normally couldn't live but just a few minutes being given penicillin and just in a week's time, they were almost back to normal. Doctors from all over the world came to the hospital and lined the walls watching this miracle drug. I saw penicillin cure gangrene and other illnesses that would have been fatal had it not been for penicillin. Of course, in recent years, we don't like to give penicillin because you uh, form a, an immune, it destroys your immune system for when you really need it. But that was the highlight of my military service. There were good times and bad times, and San Diego was a wild and woolly town, and this little country girl from West Texas learned a lot about life in San Diego. I guess uh, one of the most memorable parts of my being in the service during World War II was the night we dropped paratroopers on Sicily. This was a, a project of uh, British American troops. I was in a 316th troop carrier group, and uh, our, our squadron was to lead the bunch in and uh, I was uh, flying on the right wing of the colonel, and uh, it's just the immensity of the ACAC -ac coming up. You see those white bullets, and you get to thinking about, oh, how pretty, and then all of a sudden you stop and realize that there's seven other bullets in between each one of those white ones that makes it a little bit more dangerous. Uh, we went on in, and they had a British fighter drop down and kind of knock out some of the ACAC, -ac, and that cleared a spot. And when we got into our drop zone, why, we were about five miles off of where we supposed to have been, and we were hit with something. We wouldn't know what. So we pushed the jump light, and fortunately all the paratroopers got out and landed. But as we tried to get back to the state, or back to the uh, landing field on Africa, 
my, when we landed, my, I looked up and saw this hole in my airplane, and I wondered then how in the world I ever got through it. <laughs> we, the only thing we could figure out was one of the engines fell off of one of the other airplanes and went through mine, and how it missed all those troopers. I don't know, we had 21 troopers aboard that thing. But this, those guys jumping down into that fire, it just, it's been indelible in my mind ever since. But it's just, you feel like that you're in the war and you'd like to get out of it, but that's just it. And that's about the most memorable I remember right at the moment. My name is Jim Gressel. When Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941, I was a teenager like you are. I didn't know what Pearl Harbor was and didn't know where it was, but I did know that the bombing triggered the United States involvement in World War II. From that day on, our lifestyles we had been used to changed dramatically because the entire nation now focused on war preparedness. Being a teenager, at that time, I had no concept of the realities of war, the bloodshed and the killings. My concept was formed by what I read in the newspaper and heard on the radio. We did not have TV or the instantaneous worldwide news coverage which is available today. The realization of what war be began to sink in when commonly pur purchased items such as shoes, sugar, Okay, Meat. Tell you what, let's do. Let's back up to to a starting point ahead of where you where you stumbled there. Okay. We'll, uh, the real back here. The realization of what war was really about began to sink in when commonly purchased items such as shoes, sugar, meat, tires, and gasoline were rationed. Your parents received a family book of rationed coupons, and for these and other items, and you could only buy what the ration coupon allowed. This, frankly, was quite a change from what we were used to. I'm sure some of you who drove, drive cars would find gasoline rationing quite a problem. Suppose you were allowed to drive the family car and found out you were only allowed four gallons of gas a week. Why did it come down? Because that's all you were allowed. Gas rationing consisted of three levels. A card, four gallons a week for a family car, a B card, which is semi-business and semi-family, about eight gallons a week, and then the C card, which is strictly for business and allowed you unlimited gas. Each of these levels of rationing was displayed by a window sticker on your windshield, and that was definitely enforced. Oh, I also forgot to tell you that the highway speed limits were 35 miles an hour, and it took forever to go anywhere. Bicycles and walking were very much in vogue now as a mode of transportation for teenagers. Also, new cars were not being built from the years 1940 to 1946, so you had to maintain the old flivver in running condition. Another item of war preparedness were air raid blackouts. They were when all windows and doors were covered with light-proof shades inside, so light could not be visible from the air. During these practice blackouts, a civil, civil defense monitor would patrol or his or her area to see if the area was blacked out properly, and if not, to enforce, enforce compliance. Boo. Another reality was that of drafting the individuals into the armed services. All young men who turned 18 received a greetings from the government requesting them to repeat, report rather for military service. I received my greetings in my senior year in high school, the day, on my, the day after my 18th birthday. I was allowed to graduate, and then right after that, I reported into the Army. I was very fortunate because the hostilities were over. However, I was required to fulfill my obligation to the armed services. The things I have briefly discussed with you today probably seem ludicrous, absurd, or even un unbelievable. As a teenager in the war years, our lives were definitely impacted, but we adapted to what we had to do. As teenagers in today's unsettled world, you're going to be okay, and you will adapt to whatever requirements are necessary for you to continue with your lives. That's it.
Good morning. I'm Wayne Calhoun, and I'd like to share with you a few experiences I had in my 28 years of service in the Air Force. I promise not to bore you with exciting assignments to London, Paris, Frankfurt, Tokyo, and Hawaii, mainly because I was never assigned there. My 28 years included more exciting places such as Korea, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. The Southeast Asia assignment consisted of six six-month tours, back-to-back, -back, so to speak, at various B-52 locations. I flew 108 combat missions in the B-52 and dropped the bombs on the target and returned to my base. Those missions were personally and professionally rewarding, but the one assignment that I will always remember was as the commander of the 307th Strategic Wing at Utapau, Thailand in 1975. We completed all operational assignments without much difficulty, but the most discouraging part of the job was the problem of illegal drugs and our young airmen. As you may know, North Thailand and Burma and Laos are part of the Golden Triangle where a large part of the illegal drugs are produced. Heroin was pure, plentiful, cheap, and of course addictive. When I, I was not well informed of the illegal drugs, so I decided I would sit in the drug rehabilitation program at the base hospital. That was called Drugs 101, I guess. When I, took, when I looked around at the young people who were attending, I noticed one young airman uh, in starched fatigues, clean shaven, neat haircuts, shine shoes. I couldn't believe it, I was stunned. I couldn't imagine him being in the drug program. So I asked him what he was there for. And he told me that he had been using drugs the entire year that he had been assigned to Thailand and that he thought he better go into the drug rehab before he went home to his wife and family. The rehab program lasted from Monday until Friday noon. In most cases, the medical treatment could cure the body of the desires for drugs, but the mind did not get the same treatment. That was the real problem. And the standing joke was the shortest time between graduation from rehab and the first fix. And that was about 10 minutes or about the time it took to go from the base hospital to the main gate in a taxi where drugs were readily available. Prior to my arrival, it was common for people to extend their one-year tour for one, two, or sometimes three years. I could see that as a potential problem. So I implemented a policy of no extensions, period. That policy met with a lot of resistance, and I made no exceptions, although I had some interesting requests. Additionally, I requested the Air Force Personnel Center at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio not to send me anybody who had been assigned to Thailand before. I know the only reason a person would want to come back to there voluntarily was because they really wanted to come back to Candyland. One day, the OSI, that's the military FBI, came to my office and advised me that they were going to make a large drug bust in one of my squadrons. The agent told me that the crew chief on one of our B-52s was going to place a large package of illegal drugs in a secret location on one of our bombers that was being prepared to return to the States. Our, our aircraft were regularly rotated back to the States, so it was not unusual in this case. When I inquired of the crew chief's history, his squadron commander advised me that he knew the crew chief was one of his very best. I then asked, was the crew chief's first tour of duty in Thailand? The commander said he would investigate and call me back. He called back and said the crew chief was on his third, third extension. Now that really got my attention, and it will validate my no extension policy. I then asked the commander if the crew chief lived in the barracks on the base. The commander said he would check on it and call me back. I waited, and finally the commander called me back and said the crew chief maintained a room in the barracks. I said, I understand that, but does he live on the barracks, in the barracks? Again, please confirm that the crew chief actually lived on the base. I was not surprised when the commander called again and told me that the crew chief did not, in fact, live on the base but rather, he was married to a Thai girl, and they lived in at Pattaya Beach, the resort of Thailand. 
they operated a recreational compound at Patia Beach where young airmen from our base could go there, spend some time off with speedboats, water skis, drugs, girls, you name it. They had the works. Young airmen could spend their time off at this compound and not get caught because they had Thai guards for security. The crew chief was caught, prosecuted, and was given 20 years at Fort Leavenworth and a bad contact discharge. A very sad story, but true. Thank you. My name is Bill Fuller. I served in World War II for a period of time as a draftee. I was drafted as a sophomore out of A&M College in 1944 and immediately went to Camp Robinson, Arkansas for basic training. As soon as we finished basic training, I went to Camp Stoneman, California for shipment to the Pacific Theater of Operations. On the way, we toured a great portion of the Pacific Ocean since the troop ship was a converted freighter that made about four knots to six knots. And we bypassed Hawaii. From a distance on the horizon, we saw the northern shore of New Guinea, joined a convoy to the Philippine Islands that left us behind about the second day out because we were going too slow. We eventually landed at Lady Gulf in the Philippines as replacements to the 24th Infantry Division, who was in the middle of their campaign to reclaim the southern half of the Philippine Islands. The campaign was quickly over, and we went into training for a landing in Japan. The war ended before the landing so we became a portion of the Army of Our American Army of Occupation there. We were stationed in Matsuyama Shikoku, a medium-sized town in its day. This city had been com almost completely destroyed by bombing, fire bombs. Most of the construction was wood, so the fire bombs had been extremely effective. Only a few buildings were left standing one of which was the home of Dr. Sugai, the director of the Sugai Hospital. My buddy and I were walking through town one day and wondering how this house, of all others, had been saved. It was a rather imposing three-story structure on a small rise at the edge of town. As we walked by, the doctor came out on the front porch and spoke to us. Later on, we were invited to his home for dinner and were very impressed by the hospitality that we received since we were a part of the invading forces that had caused a great deal of misery and destruction to the city and to its people. We visited on several other occasions and were always greeted with warm hospitality. I still have a picture of the doctor's house and his old Model A Ford a 1929 model. Now the picture was taken in 1945. We also walked into the hills surrounding the city. The farmers were cultivating their fields, which consisted of very narrow strips of land, extremely long but very narrow, that were leveled and held in place by rock walls that were some six to eight foot in height. They had very little left after the war and were scrambling to feed themselves and their families and to take care of friends and relatives in town. We expected the people of this destroyed area to be very resentful and afterwards wondered how we'd had the nerve to walk among them so soon after American bombs had destroyed their homes and their businesses. When we walked around the area, I was always accompanied by the unit old man. He was some 26 years old, 
my self-appointed guardian and went with me everywhere I went. Of course, he was also six foot two and weighed in a little over 220 pounds. Now, this did make a rather imposing uh, picture. Could this have contributed to our hospitable treatment in the area? I doubt it, because even with his size, there were only two of us and many of them. This sharp contrast of the people we met in Japan and the Japanese military encountered during the war was difficult to understand. I recognize that this experience is not at all like the stories of Bataan, Iwo Jima, and other island battles that were fought by the American military. Perhaps this shows that the heart of a country is not always the actions of their warriors. Actually, uh, I agreed uh, to do this not because of my own military service, but because of my family. I was in the Navy for uh, two years and, um, strangely enough, stationed on the Mojave Desert as a part of that time. But I wanted to tell you about my family. My mother and dad reared six sons, and at one time, five of us were in the military service at one time. Three were in um, hostile environments in the South Pacific. Um, one of my brother's uh, plane crashed, and uh, he was rescued by natives on the Solomon Islands. He still won't uh, tell us about the uh, episode, but some of his friends in the service have um, indicated some of the things that happened to them. Um, my uh, brother, just older than I, uh, was on a destroyer escort in the South Pacific when it was attacked by suicide bombers, but they all thank thankfully missed his ship. Uh, then my oldest brother, who actually joined the Navy before the war started and rose to be a chief petty officer, was in some conflicts in the South Pacific as well. When people ask me uh, who my hero is concerning World War II, I tell them it's my mother. Uh, she had those six sons in the service. She wrote to us every week. Uh, she uh, prayed for us. She suffered uh, the, the um, absence of her sons. And um, I know uh, led uh, her to an early grave, but she was a hero. And not just to me, but a hero to uh, all my brothers and to my father as well. Thank you very much. With some 31 years uh, in the active army, two of them in combat, I have a lot of uh, fond memories. But uh, I've chosen to relate to you, hopefully, something that will offer you a unique insight into the dark side of war. I was a mechanized infantry battalion commander in South Vietnam. We were located there for operations in a sizable area adjacent to several villages. When I received orders to move the battalion north, we prepared to move and typically we booby-trapped our positions to deny the enemy access. We departed and not long thereafter there was a loud explosion. It was reported to me, I was in my command and control helicopter, and I ordered Captain McCauley and his company to return and prepare to engage. While he was doing so, I flew over the site in my command and control helicopter and observed women from the adjacent village uh, carrying improvised stretchers made of banana leaves. Captain McCauley arrived and confirmed the remains of two young boys in those banana leaf stretchers. He rendered assistance, but I can tell you he was also just torn apart by what he observed. This is a young man about 25 years old, only three years out of West Point. I too was mindful of my two young sons, 
about the same age. The villagers told us that the Viet Cong, an extension, paramilitary extension of the North Vietnamese Army, had induced the young boys to go into the site knowing how we operated. Effectively, they sacrificed the lives of those two young boys. Captain McCauley and I will suffer that emotional scar for the rest of our lives. We're now witnessing bombs that are inadvertently striking unarmed civilians. I can assure you that in Afghanistan, all of those involved, certainly Americans, this weighs heavily on their conscience. And it does because all of us are imbued with a high sense of honor, duty, and individual responsibility. General George C. Marshall, General of the Armies, uh, said it best. He said that no one abhors war more than the soldier who has been there. I am especially grateful to Jane and to Rick for affording me the opportunity to participate in this veterans program, and I hope this message is of value. Thank you. My name is Howard Stone, and I served during World War II from 1943, 1944, and 45. I was in the United States Marine Corps and uh, during that time. And most of the time when I was in the Marine Corps, I was uh, assigned to squadron VMTB-132. That's a Marine Air Corps squadron. And we served uh, unusually. Our squadron and another squadron served on a, a CBE escort Navy carrier, which was Cape Gloucester 109. We served out in the South Pacific, of course, <clears throat> made uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a few rounds. Our planes did quite a few bombing and we got to quite a few dogfights. And uh, we lost some planes, of course, and uh, we just uh, hung in there. And toward the end of the war, we'd been doing some uh, watching for kamikaze planes. And, during the war, why, at the end of the war there, why, one of them happened to get through there and one night, and he hit us a little bit too high. He hit on the flight deck, and he bounced off and hit the U.S. Pennsylvania. And if he'd been a little bit lower, of course, he'd been under our flight deck and got us, but he just skipped off our deck like a rock and hit the U.S. Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and after the, uh, after the war, why, the, uh, Aircraft carrier was sent to Nagasaki to pick up the prisoners of war from uh, some of the prisoners of war from the Bhutan Death March. That was a very, very interesting deal to meet those people that had been in prison for over three years and riding back with them all the way back to the States, which took about 28 days or 25 days, and got to visit with, got to know quite a few of them, and uh, they told about all their experiences. and. If you didn't hear it, why, you couldn't hardly believe what all they went through. They went through a lot, and my hats are off to them. And it was a, a very interesting experience. Uh, we, uh, of course, we were, we were lucky. Uh, we didn't get uh, hit. The ship didn't get hit. We had some pilots we lost. But uh, very fortunately, uh, I made it back to the States, and uh, that was, uh, big extent of our trip uh, after three years. My name is uh, Dale Hulsey. I spent uh, World War II in, in the uh, Army Air Force. I was assigned to the 8th Air Force temporarily and then transferred on detached duty to North Africa to fly one specific mission, which was the Ploesti low-level bombing raid. Generals and uh, War correspondents later labeled this as the most, uh, pardon me, the most uh, effective bombing mission in World War II. We called it the greatest mission of World War II. We were shot down, my crew was, uh, after leaving the target, and we spent 319 days in Yugoslavia. 
as uh, accompanied by the uh, uh, Yugoslav partisans, uh, where we fought uh, many battles with the different groups. We robbed two trains simultaneously in one, sta <coughs> one station. We uh, captured but was unable to destroy one power generating station. And at one point we were completely surrounded by uh, Gestapos that were sent down specifically to capture or kill us before Americans off my crew. But we escaped uh, totally unharmed. <clears throat> I guess the uh, closest any of us came to being killed was one day the co-pilot gave the uh, bombardier a piece of bread and an onion to keep for him because he wasn't feeling up to eating at that particular time. And when he got ready to eat the bread and the onion, the bombardier had already eaten it. And so I, I felt sure one of them was going to buy their time right then. But they finally settled their argument. And later on, the uh, OSS rescued us from Yugoslavia after 319 days. And we estimated <coughs> walking 4,000 miles while we were in there. Of course, this, this whole experience was by far my greatest experience of the whole war. However, when I came back from overseas, I helped train uh, crew members for B-29 crews to be sent to the South Pacific. And that was, I thought, uh, pretty expensive training for me just to fly one mission, but it was, I feel, one of the most worthwhile missions that I could have been on. Are we ready to go? Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Ed Curry. In 1942, I had taught school in Arizona for a couple of years, and I was drafted and sent to El Paso and then to Shepherd Field for my basic training which incidentally was not much fun. And from there, they sent me to Sioux Falls, South Dakota to radio, Air Force radio school. I was there for a year and a half, and while the winters were rough with uh, those tar paper shacks with the snow coming down horizontally rather than vertically, the snow would pile up on one end of the dormitory and nothing on the other end. And the bathrooms were uh, in separate buildings several uh, yards away from our shack. But the uh, notable thing there was what happened to a friend of mine and I when we went to church one Sunday. We met some folks and they, they asked us if we wanted to go out to dinner. We said, sure. So after, after church, uh, we met the Fosters, who were a very pleasant elderly couple who put us in their Cadillac and took us about three miles out of town. They drove us through their formal gardens in, around to this beautiful uh, four-story Tudor mansion and took us in to a baked lamb dinner with a little maid uh, waiting on us. And they took to us and we took to them. And from then on, we came out there almost any time we wanted to. Uh, the back sloped down to a swimming pool, and in the summertime we swam. I had my own room, had my own silk pajamas, and enjoyed the player piano and the library. Uh, after being there a year and a half, I went to Scott Field, Illinois, and there was another great experience where they had a USO in the, uh, the basement of the uh, Keel Auditorium. We could get free uh, movie tickets, and see uh, symphonies and other shows in the auditorium. And one memorable moment was when Marian Anderson sang and she put all the, the airmen on the stage back of her and then turned her turned herself to the audience and sang to us. It was quite a memorable thing. From there I went on to Boca Raton, Florida, and I had enough points so that they weren't gonna send me overseas so I was put on guard duty and KP duty 
until I was uh, discharged in 1946. W. Renfro, and I was drafted into the United States Army in October of 1952. I took basic training at uh, <coughs> Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. After basic training, I went to an additional 13-week leadership training school from which I went to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington for nine days. Then we boarded a troop carrier, the General M.M. M. Patrick, we traveled overseas to Yokohama in 14 days. We got, out, we got off at uh, Yokohama, boarded a Japanese train, went south to Sasebo, stayed there for nine days. Then we boarded another uh, ship and made an in amphibious landing at Incheon. Then we boarded a Korean train and headed north to the 38th parallel. And I spent one night at the 8th Army replacement depot. The next morning, the, I was assigned to the uh, 64th Field Artillery Battalion, 25th Infantry Division, and I served from uh, March of 1953 to August of 1954 in the artillery. And uh, our basic mission was support of the uh, infantry, and we supported the Turkish infantry uh, which I was lucky on that because the Turks are pretty good fighters and we never had to worry about our positions being overrun. Some of the some of the fellows on our right flanks and left flanks, their artillery positions, they were overrun from time to time because they were supporting some of the other infantry units and uh, they would abandon their positions and uh, they, they were overrun from time to time. But we never had to experience that. And I returned home in August of 1954 and returned to college, finished college. That's about it. Okay, good. All right, I'm George Sumner, a Texan from way back, and I'd like to tell you <clears throat> about an experience in World War II. The invasion of southern France was not nearly so difficult as was the Normandy invasion. Good preparations and lessons learned removed much of the resistance at the landing points. As a 22-year-old lieutenant, I was the leader of a 50-man unit of radar. Our mission was to detect and report aircraft movements in our assigned sector. The invasion plan called for our unit to go ashore on the second day. Late on D-Day, the Liberty ship carrying our unit, including our 10 trucks loaded with radar equipment and supplies, moved within a couple of miles of the French Riviera. On D-plus-1, we were awakened by an air raid, and from the deck we watched a flight of Ju-88s fly directly over the group of waiting ships. The ship knew next to us was not so lucky. It was hit and several ca casualties resulted. I can't say how glad I was to be off that ship in a few hours on, on firm ground. A foxhole seemed much safer even though it wasn't. Our turn to go ashore came about noon. The ship's cargo cranes lifted our trucks onto a waiting LST, that's a landing ship tank, and we went over the side on a cargo net. It didn't take long for the LST to reach the beach and lower the front end of the ship. I think we set some speed records as our trucks left that LST and left the beach. We were, went to our assigned area, which was well protected under a group of trees. For the next few days, we literally kept our heads down. There was much confusion in the Nazi army. Their communications channels were badly disrupted. Their efforts to assemble new defensive positions 
were not successful. Those days were long for us because we were anxious to get on with it, to do what we came for and for what we had trained for so long. The Nazi army f finally decided to make a major withdrawal to the north central France, thus shortening their lines between forces. This meant finally we would get moving orders. We were to set up a radar, our radar, at a site east of Lyon, some 250 miles to the north. It was on this trip that produced the most moving experience of my four years of military service. This was an experience that was touching beyond description. It was one that I will certainly never forget. Our trip took us up the Rhone Valley. This was a rich farm area with vestiges of 2,000 years of civilization. Roman bridges and aqueducts were occasionally seen. The beautiful late summer weather made for a pleasant trip. As our convoy passed through the towns and villages, the people at first seemed bewildered by the sudden departure of their conquerors. This soon turned to joy as they stood by the side of the road and shouted their greetings. Many had tears streaming down their faces, but their faces were beaming. Old and young lined the sides of the road. Men and women, girls and boys, waved enthusiastically to the Americans. They carried flowers and threw them to the soldiers riding in the truck. They gave fruit and eggs, melons and tomatoes, the best of their farms and gardens. At first, the soldiers were suspicious when they saw these offerings. What was the price? But they soon saw that the gifts were expressions of gratitude. The depth of their feelings was shown in their eyes and in the way they waved, shouted, cheered, laughed, yelled, and cried. They brought out champagne, brandy, and wines that had been hidden from the Nazis and held them at arm's length so the men could grab them as the trucks rolled by. This was a very uplifting experience for us. We were seeing the heartfelt joy of a people who had suddenly found freedom after years under the heel of the Nazi boot. Their hearts showed how truly magnificent this freedom was to them. We were elated that we had been a part of this liberation. We couldn't help but wonder if we and our fellow Americans would always be ready to stand up for our freedom when it became threatened, as it inevitably would be at some time or other. Thank you. I'm Orlo Catha. I'm a member of the Tucson class at this church. Uh, and prior to my entry in World War II, I was employed with the U.S. Steel Company in Birmingham, Alabama. I had a few months to go before I was to be drafted, and I agonized over whether I wanted to go into the Air Force or the Army. I certainly didn't want to get into the Navy. I applied for officer training in the Air Force. It was closed. In the Army, it was closed. Well, I thought I then I would try the Navy. The V-7 uh, program in the Navy was closed. As I was leaving the office of the Navy, the officer in charge called me over and said, why don't you try to get a commission? Well, okay, I said that I would. And two months later, I was an incident in the Navy, headed for Dartmouth College in New Hampshire for training. I spent two months at Dartmouth training, training about two months at Princeton University in training, and then was assigned to the NSF Warfare Training Center in Miami, Florida. After two more months of training there, I was assigned to a ship um, to be, to, to ship the end station in Pearl Harbor. It was a PC, a patrol craft, with a crew of 65 enlisted men and five officers aboard. I went aboard that ship as a communications officer, 
and <clears throat> served in that capacity for several months. And then I served in other capacities, <clears throat> and later on I was the commanding officer for the last several months I was aboard that ship. The purpose of that ship, of course, was to defend other ships while they were in the way in the underway in the Pacific against submarines. We had sound and gear for uh, aboard, and we were trained in the, to do this job. We would meet, uh, sh we were assigned to uh, ships that might be underway in the Pacific. We'd rendezvous with them, and then we would proceed them to sound out to see if there were submarines in the area, and it was our job to, to protect them. Uh, Oftentimes, we would be, do, there would be a convoy of ships, either Navy ships or, and our commercial ships. We would, um, each time, we, would zig, we had zigzag, zigzag courses that we followed during this period of time. We were in complete charge. We, we did the navigation uh, for all the ships, and we were in charge of the safety as we sailed through these waters. <clears throat> during that period of time, I guess that we touched down just about every island in the Pacific. Uh, uh, there was Guadalcanal, we operated out of Guadalcanal most of the time. We were in the Russells, the, some more islands, and, and dozens of more. But we, it was our responsibility to, to protect these ships and convoys against the submarines. If it was a large convoy, we'd have several PC craft would be operating in front of them. And that was quite a responsibility during that time. If anything happened to one of the ships, of course, you as, as, a, as a person in charge of the navigation and everything would be held responsible, I imagine. So that's about the extent of my service. Uh, we, we were, I was on this ship about two years, and uh, following that, I was assigned to a Yard, uh, yard, uh, yard oil uh, tanker in the Brooklyn Navy Yard with orders to take that back to uh, Pearl Harbor. While I was while I was on this duty, the war ended, and uh, it was diverted in there to Boston Harbor instead of going to Pearl Harbor. That was the end of my service. I guess the main thing I wanted to get out of that, or give people the impression that as a youngster going into this with no, no training whatsoever. I was able to do the things that I was required to do. I think I did them well, and this was just not my story. This is what thousands of other people who had gone into the service and experiences like this are similar. So I would like to encourage this and point out to the young men of today that they can do whatever they want to or whatever they have to and to have the confidence and uh, they need to have the confidence, confidence that they do, can do this. They certainly gave me the confidence to do the things later that I did in later life. Thank you.